In uh, Romans 6, it talks all about the death and uh, the reality that uh, for he that is dead is freed from sin and that knowing this, that we're dead with Christ, we should be raised with him also. And it just goes through all of this <clears throat> um, reality. But then it moves into Romans 7. And you go, okay, look, I thought I was dead. Uh, and it, there have even been times in my walk that I thought, you know, shouldn't Romans 7 be before Romans 6? But you feel that way because you're going, uh, until, you, until you get into the experience of it. And then you go, okay, I know all about this death stuff. I know all about this cross stuff. I'm a really spiritual person in my theology, but my life really stinks, just like this ark. <clears throat> and um, so that's when you get in Romans 7, like verse 8. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of coveting, for apart from the law, sin is dead. Uh, verse uh, 11, for sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. <clears throat> and, um, uh, you know, he ends with um, verse 25, I think, uh, let's see, verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death, from the body of this death? Then he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation. And you go, what happened? He was wretched one minute, and then he's jumping up and down for joy that there is no condemnation. And, and I've read those scriptures trying to find out what did I miss so that I could get over there in Christ in, in the new creation and not have this same wrestling thing. <clears throat> Um, um, and in truth, this is the point that I hope I made clear during the conference, and that is, in truth, in the ark, we are dead. Everything is dead. That cross crucified everything. Nobody actually got out of the judgment. Nobody actually got out of it. Okay. They're not just dead. We're dead. Okay, and but there is this <clears throat> fact of reckoning ourselves dead, and we wrestle with that because we we don't know what it is, and we believe somehow that it's a theological key, that the key is theological. That's that's the mistake. And we honestly do. We believe that the key is a theological key that's going to unlock this door. But it's not. What it is, is an experiential key. It is, and let's face it, the ark and all of the situation inside that ark, that's experiential. There's, you know, for 120 years or however long it was that Noah preached, Oh, he preached, and he preached theology, and he preached truth, and he preached God, and he preached judgment, and he preached resurrection, and he preached ark, and he preached all this stuff. But he didn't know what ark meant. Even while he's building it, he didn't know what it meant. He didn't know the H-E double ho hockey sticks that he was going to go through inside of the thing that he was preaching that was so glorious. Come on. Now, remember, there is a new creation. We will get into that eventually. But I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to point out that the th all the theology that he learned and all of the stuff that he got from God to preach and to share and all of the clarity that he got as to how to build an ark sort of trained him in a certain way. It trained him in the sense of... of uh, <clears throat> I'm a man of God. I get my messages from God. God speaks to me and gives me clarity. God is helping me build what he wants by showing me. Okay. But he doesn't have any clue what the real meaning of that ark is until he's inside it. 
even though he knows more about the ark and how to build one than anybody. You know, but it's all knowledge. It's all, even if it's great mysteries that have been unveiled, you can have all mysteries. And if you do not have this worked into a life, a manner in which you proceed, it's not going to make any difference. And what's going to shake up our way of applying the information we got, what's going to shake that up is getting into this ark. Because before we get in, we have one mindset and one view and one way that we think it's all going to go. And you get in there, and once you're in there, door shut. Door is shut. And it's, at that point, God's going to keep you in there. I, 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 it's always amused me how God worded that in Galatians 4 when he says uh, that we have been, you know, that the heir, as long as he is immature, differeth nothing from a servant, though he is Lord of all, and is under tutors and governors, meaning God's, outward dealings and they're not being dealt with by the father but by the father's instruments because you're not being dealt with as a son yet but as a tiknon as a child as it is in the greek not a son two different words and so and and two different meanings and two different relationships and two different levels of maturity and so god uh, puts you into this ark to grow you up to grow you up. And what's funny is, he's not growing you up making you responsible for the animals. He's growing you up making you not responsible for the animals, for the beasts. <laughs> but in there, you're so under the law, you're such a man of God or woman of God that you're bearing the whole burden of the responsibility of this thing. And it's eating your lunch. It's just honestly... It's too much. Okay. Now that's good because God must bring each and every one of us to a place of brokenness where we know that not just the present circumstance is just too much because that's usually what many come to. The present circumstance is just too much and they start knocking a hole in the side of that ark to get out. <laughs> and, and that's a fact, Jack. <laughs> And then they go spread stories about what's going on in the ark. <laughs> but you have to, you have to, it's God's trip. It's not yours. Or it's not mine. It's God's trip. <laughs> and he's got a plan and it's a good plan and he loves you and he's dressing you to get out. He's preparing you. He's He's having you buy land in the new creation because that's where you're going to live when this thing is over with. There's going to be a whole nother reality at work in you and you want that or you would never have gotten in the ark. But wanting it before you walk the plank into makes you want to walk the plank to get out of. It's a whole different want to. The want to going in feels like the mighty men of God dedicating themselves to the Lord. But on the inside, you begin to react the way the animals do, and you begin to wonder if there is any difference between them and you. And it's not fun, and it's scary, but it's necessary, and it's not forever. It's not forever. You know, I will tell you that this Bible school has been patterned after the ark. <laughs> it's a fact. It's not a lie. It's the, it was intentionally done that way. And it was intentionally done that way because when I went through my role of doing all this stuff and realized certain things, I knew that it was going to take more than a Sunday morning, Sunday night service to get, because you can run, you can hide, you can... You know, do you understand what I'm saying? You can, you can act real spiritual and then leave. But in the ark, you're shut in. And so it, it requires an environment that shuts you in, that you cannot just run from. You know, it, it requires that. If you really want Jesus, 
It's going to, it will take that. The only reason why we would ever establish such a thing is to get people to the Lord in a greater way than they would have otherwise. That's the only reason. That's, you know, there is, believe it or not, my temperament is such, I don't really get any joy out of uh, torturing people. I don't. I don't at all. I, ha I'm, I am one of the biggest hindrances around here to that. Because I don't like to see, but on the other hand, you got to go through this. If you're going to get the Lord, you have to. So, you know, if someone, if I detect someone doesn't want the Lord, I'll get them out. I'll cover for them and da-da-da-da. But if they want the Lord, then I'll just go, okay, you're on your own in the sense of, you, because, you know, it feels like you're walking a way that no one else has ever been before. And you're the first one, and there's no security of seeing the beaten path. You know what I'm saying? It feels like you're cutting your way through a jungle that no one has been through before. And God, you know, you ever had this thought, nobody understands me? Anybody ever had that thought? Well, folks, let me tell you, in the place that you're at right there, God wants to make you feel that way. You must feel that way. The only hope is that you will eventually throw yourself on the Lord and cling to him in ways that no teaching could ever do for you. No teaching could ever do for you. The ark is experiential. The ark is your experience. And so, um, I'll get in trouble for this statement, but I, I, I say it's the, it's the purgatory between life and death. <laughs> uh, of course, in reality, we know there's no purgatory, but spiritually there is in the sense that it is bridging, you know, from the judgment over here to the new creation, and you are in that holding tank in between where God is going to find out, do you really love me? Are you really with me? Will you abide with me? You know, that, you know we're either going to accuse God of being mean because he's doing this to us, right? Or what? We're going to turn on ourselves and say, well, I'm, I guess I'm just not cut out to, I'm, you know, I'm not one of a few good men or whatever, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I, I can't make it. I'm not the right stuff. All of that is, is the wrong conclusion. All of that is the wrong conclusion. The right conclusion is God loves you. God has his hand on you. God will bring you through. You can trust him. Uh, yes, you are a mess, but when, but the, in the process of what he's doing, when, when that door opens and you step out, you will step out in a whole nother understanding. There are things built that build up to that. Some relating to the window, some things that we'll get into. But right at the very end of the journey, you're making some decisions that, all click in because God was twisting and turning and doing things in you, flipping switches and doing stuff that you have no control, nor do you even understand. You wouldn't know. You know, it's kind of like uh, there's an atom bomb going off over here, and it's got, you know, uh, a keypad, and it's got seven buttons, and they have to be flipped in the right order, and the keypad has to have the right numbers in, and you're just over there, you know, you know. Well, God knows. He flips this button, presses those things there, you know, turns this knob, you know. We don't even know about the buttons inside of us. We don't even know what it's going to take to get us there. We are children in that sense. We, God is our Father, and we have to trust Him. And so, but only experientially is, he, is this going to happen. It's going to take getting us out of control, meaning where we're no longer in control or think we're in control. We never were in control. Either way, you know, either, you know, really had a, either had a handle on this or were we ever children that were really in control. We're, we're all out of control. But he, he knows, he knows your heart and he knows where you want to go and he knows just the things 
through. I've had time after time Bible school student come to me and say, why did you put so-and-so as my roommate? Well, I, we just felt like we heard from the Lord. Why? Well, they're driving me crazy. I mean, you would not believe. They, 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 I had one of them say, it's almost like they were handpicked to be perfectly what I could not stand. I said, then we're doing our job. <laughs> you know, Because God knows what we need. God knows what we need to get, not just what we need, to, what we need to get so that we can finally get to that place where there is, how about love, real love, not self-love, not loving for what we can get, joy, real joy, not just happiness based on happenings, peace, real peace, my peace I give you, not as the world gives. I mean... We believe in all these things, but you don't see it too often in too many Christians. But there is stability. Thank God, stability. Now, once you know inside that ark, there wasn't any stability until the very end. It always rocked. It always shook. It always, even being inside, in Christ, in there, there was enough shifting and stuff to keep your walk always sort of unsteady. Because the true walk isn't going to take place till you get outside, till you get into the new creation. That's where the walk begins, and everything is preparation up to that point. <clears throat> so, the ark is, you know, everything is dead. You're dead. Those beasts that are in there with you, and listen carefully to this. Those beasts that are in there with you are dead also in that if it's a true picture of Christ and him crucified, the cross crucified everything. Yes. They are dead. You think they're alive. But every beast, remember, do you, anybody remember what we read in the very first thing of the conference where we went through the scriptures and showed all these unclean things and all these things of this earth and all these things of the old creation that were brought in there, these were not clean beasts. There were clean beasts brought in there, but the majority were not. They, you know, everything is dead by the flood. But for us, the ark is the place where we must experientially come to a place where we reckon it dead. And that is not a theological switch that one day clicks in your head no it's not it's not it is the culmination of certain things that the lord has shared with you plus your the experiences that god has brought you through to that very moment so that you see someone can tell you um, Jesus is everything, and you shouldn't go by your own strength. Just because they tell you that, and just because you believe that, doesn't mean you won't get up, walk out of here, and do everything in your own strength. You know, you're not going to learn that lesson except in the ark, in the experience of, of what God puts you through to bring you to a place where at the end of that journey, Noah... He only found recourse in two things, an altar and booze. <laughs> he, he, he built an altar and he just went and got drunk. Folks, at the end of that thing, you know that you, you've had it. Yeah. What I mean by that is, and this is, uh, again, this is just words, but this is also reality. You are not sick of the beasts. You are sick of your beasts because those are yours. You are fed up with you and all that you have tried to save and redeem and drag along that should have been at the cross out there. 
Now remember, this is just a type and shadow. It can't be a full clarity, absolutely cross the board picture, but it is, a, in my opinion, it's a darn good picture that, that we tried to redeem these things. We tried to save them. We tried to bring them through. Now, we know the story. God said da-da-da-da and all that stuff. But if you follow the pattern of the cross, it is we believe in the cross, but we're still trying to save stuff that we have not yet submitted to that cross. And I'm telling you, not just stuff. You, your mind would automatically go, yeah, when you think of one thing or two things that I, I just haven't, I haven't given up yet. Oh, no, he's thinking of a bunch of stuff. And guess what that stuff is? You, the hyena you. The pig you, the monkey you, the you you, E-W-E, -E, anyway. <clears throat> um, so, so you're between, as it were, life and death. You're raised up, but you're not, in the new, you're not walking in the new creation yet. You have experienced resurrection out of the judgment. You know it's true. You know it's nobody can take that from you. But your experience is telling you that there's more yet. Now, answer me this. Would not it be confusing if you thought that just believing all this and coming to this fact that you'd never heard before, that if you believe that that would make you free and then you continued to act the way you did or had these things show up, you might come to this conclusion, well, maybe the teaching here isn't true either, you know, or isn't sufficient, or isn't enough. Maybe it's true, but, you know, kind of like the, you know, somebody says the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or this or that, or whatever, gifts of the Spirit, you know, that took you only so far, but it didn't remedy everything, so there's, this, you know, this ain't it either. Well, you know, there, there's not any more on the other side of death. You're dead, and Christ is your life, you know. But it's not the facts of it. It's not the theology of it. It's not the doctrine of it. I'm going to say it like this. It's the ark of it. <laughs> it's the ark of it. That'll, that'll do it. That'll, switch, that'll flip switches. That'll bring, start the thing in motion. Who, who can describe that specifically for you? Nobody. Nobody, nobody, only God knows exactly which switch to flip when in your life. But we can trust him because, again, that ark didn't have a rudder on it, but it had the Lord guiding it. It had the Lord guiding it. <clears throat> so, um, so, th so I just want to make sure that there's this this understanding that we are in the ark, you are separated from the old creation, right? You're in the ark, it's out there and under the death. But in your experience, you still seem to be dealing with its issues. You're dealing with it on a personal level. You're dealing with um, growling and howling and pooping and restless impatience. <laughs> and, and a lot more. And you don't know what's wrong with you because you have been embracing this truth of being crucified with Christ as much as you know how. Man, how confusing would that be? Well, again, you're going through something they're not. You have to face these beasts, and that's what's going on. So let's, let's look at a scripture here in 2 Corinthians 5, one that you're very familiar with, but it'll help make this point. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 17 <coughs> and 18. <coughs> Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become N-E-W. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. So um, there just can be no question that these beasts are not in the old creation that, where the flood happened. Can I get amen on that? The, 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 the beasts are not there clearly, okay? And they're not going to be in the new creation doctrinally, even though they came out of the ark. The truth is, 
they didn't make it out of the flood. In the, in the clear picture, in the shadow, yes, because it's not a perfect picture. Because how could God give a perfect picture of these animals dying over here and yet you're dealing with them here if they're dead over here, but they're not over here? You, you understand what I'm saying? It's just hard to make that bridge in the shadow. But in the truth, they're not, everything died in that old creation. There's nothing alive in the old creation. And the truth is, there are no beasts in the new creation. And just as true, there are no beasts in the ark except your beast that you have not yet fully embraced that cross in a manner that would reckon them dead and mortify them in your life. The cross is still a doctrine. Okay? You know? You say, well, when you step out of the ark, do you come to perfection? No, no, no. The, I think the process goes on and on and on. But I do believe that there are certain, and here's the key, I believe there are certain things that God settles in that ark that will be foundational to you the rest of your life. They will save you from, from uh, snares that you will not step into when you would have had you not gone through it. No, there's no question about that. They will have you walk in a walk with the Lord in such a manner that you will be avoiding all sorts of snares and problems that you never would, you, you'll never until, you know, unless God explains it to you in glory somehow or another, you won't even know you avoid it. Because you're just walking by the life of Christ and as much as you know how, and you're avoiding major stuff. You know, I mean, an example I think of is, is my wife. You know, I was a defensive driving, defensive driving teacher for the city of Denton for, for years. And, you know, I taught the police department and I taught the fire department. And, you know, I'm teaching these guys how to drive and how to do it all right and everything. So I'm driving down, or I'm going down the road, my wife's driving, and, and um, <clears throat> she gets into a situation. And I say, you know, uh, you're about to be in a bad situation here that if you would always do this, you would never be in that situation. Just, you just have to recognize I'm entering that situation. And so I explain it to her, and so she drops back and da-da-da-da. So, you know, a week later, she's driving along, and she gets in the situation again. I say, you know, a lot of times we end up in trouble because we're not paying attention, and we end up in the middle of a problem before we even know it. And the best way to avoid a problem, or the best way to get out of a problem, is to avoid it altogether. Same situation. Week after week, explaining the same thing. But it's like I have to give divine intervention every time to every event instead of one principle working forever. We do that all the time. We are constantly in trouble because we don't know the principles of the life of Christ and we just end up in trouble and then we cry unto the Lord, whereas some people never are hardly in those kind of problems because of the, their walk with the Lord. So I'm telling you that there are benefits <laughs> that going through this ark is well worth it. Well worth it. Another example comes to my mind. When we were here, Paul and his wife, Sharon, and, and uh, Lindsay were here from Arizona, and he asked, his wife had been sort of a hippie type person, and I was too, but he wasn't. And he said, well, did the military do you any good? And I said, yes. I said, it did me major good. And he said, how is that? And I said, number one, I never got up before, you know, <laughs> 11 o'clock, if that, uh, every day. And, you know, here we're getting up at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock every morning and stuff. It taught me discipline. It taught me stuff that I never had in me before. Well, was, you know, basic training and uh, your MOS training, and I went through a special sergeant school and all this was all that hard. I said it was incredibly hard. I said, you know, the, the specialty school that I went through, like only one-third of all the people, all the top people that were chosen to go through it even made it to the end of the program. And, um, and the point being, 
it was really, really, really hard. And I put myself, like for that specialty school, which was the hardest one, I chose that. They said, we'd like for you to go through this school. We think you're, you've got leadership ability. We think it'll do you a lot of good, and we think it'll do the men a lot of good. Um, we'd like for you to go through it, but it's your choice. And you can drop out at any time if you don't like what you're, you know, what, how hard it is. And I said, okay, I'll do it. And man, they threw stuff at you, I'm telling you. <laughs> you could not imagine. But they've, they've you know, it's kind of like the devil. They've used these tricks over and over and over. New, new group comes in, you know, and I mean, they hit you between the eyes of stuff you couldn't even imagine. But it's, it's to find out how you would react under fire and under stress and under all this stuff. When I came out, you know, man, I, there was something in me that that had built in. It was good for me to have gone through that, and I'm glad that I did. Well, this art thing is a similar thing. You know, there's so many things that were just sloppy if you didn't go through it that the Lord will save you from. So, I, you know, who can tell you the benefits? The goal has to be, I want the Lord, and I believe this is the Lord's path. It's just a heart for Jesus. That has to be the bottom line. So... Um, uh, the scripture says that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. These beasts uh, appear alive. We're making them alive. We're making them a factor in our life. That's the best way to say it. We're making them a factor in our life. They're done away with. Jesus settled this. You're wrestling with something that's already put away and gone and dead. You're trying to get God to support or strengthen or bless or give grace to something that he crucified. You see? Oh, Lord, you know, just strengthen my old man. He's going, no. <laughs> You're dead. Well, I don't act like it. And he'd go, boy, that's a truth. <laughs> that's a fact. You don't. There's... You know, and there's all those, those reactions and all that kind of stuff going on. And this reckoning, they have to be reckoned dead to you and by you. Um, I know this is a dumb example, but I'm going to give you another example. I'm only giving these examples because I believe that there's some, sometimes a story helps communicate something uh, better, see, even while I'm going off on that, I'm forgetting what the story was that I was going to tell you. Ah, maybe it'll come to me a little bit. Maybe the Lord didn't want me to tell that one. So, but when we, here's the thing, when we go into the ark, the one thing that is clear to us is that we're righteous and everyone else is messed up understand because surely Noah did surely he thought he, you know what I'm saying surely he thought you know wow I'm really I'm really tight with God you know and uh, so he's going in there and he's righteous and all these other people have mocked him he thought that was the hard part those people this is I'm glad I'm getting out of here oh baby you ever heard of out of the skillet into the fire? <laughs> you ever heard, not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer? That's a fact. That's when you're, you know, you, you thought, they're doing this to me. They're saying this. They're hurting my feelings. They did this. They did that. Nah, nah, nah. Nah, nah, nah. Sound familiar? And the Lord says, you know, I'm really, I'm really sick of that. You know, I, I've got a special place for you, my special one. And because we're so full of ourselves, we go, oh, what is it, Lord? Oh, praise God, you know. I'm telling you guys, you better repent, you little punks. I'm going to get the good stuff. No, they just, they just died in one big great judgment. You, you died daily. <laughs> you're dying daily in that ark as, you're, as a new creature pops up. You know, 
Noah didn't go out and gather them in the sense of, you know, I, he went to Africa and got two of every kind there. and went, God gathered them. God brought them. And all of a sudden, you know, God said, okay, now, and they all started moving toward the ark. They probably all got in the ark at the right time. And Noah probably didn't know every beast or everything, every creeping thing that was in there. He discovered them when he's locked in there with them. You know? God knows how to shut us up. You know, from, oh, they did this, and they said that, and then God's going to shut you up. <laughs> in the ark, I mean. <laughs> he will. Every mouth shall be shut. Before, you know, how, I forget how that scripture goes exactly, but. <clears throat> so, um. And, and again, we are being faced with these beasts being our own and no longer the world's. Uh, look in uh, John chapter 3 is a good scripture that will help us see this. John 3. <clears throat> and that is uh, this uh, process. Of course, we saw that process in... Uh, um, in the scripture over there in 2 Corinthians. And that was um, the outward man perishing, but the inward man being renewed day by day. But here, John says in verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. And your heart cry, and this is, this is, a, this is an ark prayer. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are different kinds of prayers. This one is an ark prayer. You don't normally pray this one until you've come to the ark. Outside the ark, you're praying, you know, Lord, this person that's bothering me, they must decrease. <laughs> Meaning, you know, if they're on the job, Lord, see to it that they get fired. You know, this per if it's if it's someone that's, you know, in the group around here in the church or something that drives you crazy, oh Lord, you know, put them in the lower seat and exalt me and use me so that they will be embarrassed. You know what I mean? That they'll be ashamed that they ever thought bad of me. In other words, lift me up so high that they will just be so ashamed. Those are prayers that are not, they don't, you never hear those things coming out of the ark. All you hear out of the ark is, Lord, you must increase and I must decrease. God, you've got to work in me this reality of the cross. Just thought I'd check, check something here. Work in me this thing of, of uh, nature and not of theology, of... of um, me being renewed in the spirit of my mind, not in the information of my mind. Because knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And love being the nature of God, God is love. God is love. He's not loving. God is love. <clears throat> and that means that love edifies. And that means that um, love uh, gives itself for others, love vaunteth not itself, meaning all the things I said that, that you pray outside the ark. It, uh, it believeth all things, it hopeth all things. There is a, um, there, a, something switches over. When we were building the ark, we were full of pride because we were called to build it and we knew it was of God and others were mocking what we were doing. 
but we knew it was God. And instead of that making us humble, that made us more proud. And every time God gave us something to share to the people, and they rejected it. It made us feel like, well, we're the only ones that are listening to God. And all of these things begin to, to uh, instead of bringing about death in us, they are actually uh, becoming a life support system for something that's dead. You ever heard of somebody being brain dead? But they, they keep their other functions going, you know? They got breathing machines and all this stuff, you know, but they're brain dead, you know. Well, you know, they're not alive. You've got an, a machine that is artificially making them breathe, but if you turned off all of the equipment that you created, they would be gone. Well, you know, I'm not making a statement as to what we should do in medical situations. I'm making a spiritual principle statement, and that is we have our machines, our ways of keeping the old man alive and looking like he's... And what, what we want to do, too, is uh, we want to prop him up and make him look as healthy and happy as possible. When in reality, he's dead. No, no, he's breathing. Look, you know, no, no. I mean, there's still, you can still see there's, you know, uh, a redness about his skin and everything, you know, because the heart machine is keeping it pumping through his veins. But he's not. He's not. But to us, he is. And as long as those beasts are there, when you're in the ark, your prayer finally comes to purity. And it says, I'm so sick of me, but I'm not going to commit suicide, and I'm not going to quit. I'm going to change my approach. My approach is death. My approach is quitting, but not by the flesh. I'm not going to commit suicide, and I'm not just going to quit. I'm going to quit Spirit. And, you know, that story I told you earlier was true that, you know, well, I, I'm sick of me. I don't want to do it. So you just sit in the corner and you don't do anything. That was me. That was me when New Creation Fellowship started and we were gathering in my living room. And I was just burnt out and tired and tired of ministering and sick of myself. And I just, people would come over my house and I wasn't even inviting them. They're coming over to have services and stuff. And I'd sit in the corner and just say, well, y'all do whatever you want. And I'd just sit over there and cry. And they'd say, Randy, we want to hear the word. We want to hear from the Lord. No, I'm just sick of me. I'm just tired. I'm just fed up with, you know, da-da-da-da and all this kind of stuff. And the Lord spoke to me after weeks and weeks of sitting there doing that. And he said, it's not that I just don't want it to be you. My, that's not my goal. I want it to be Christ. Well, what did that mean? It meant I'm going to have to change my approach. My approach was I just quit. I can't do it. I can't go anymore. It's not in me. Okay, well, that's true. But that's not the final conclusion. The final conclusion is, but you can do it. You want to reach others. You, you have strength to love others, to get up and go help the hurting. I don't. And the only way this is going to become true in me, Jesus, is if you are really, not theologically or by title, the vine, but really my vine. And if that truth can become true, then I can get up again. Then I can serve again. Then I can help again. But I have nothing to offer. And if, you, and if all that you're going to give me is, you know, well, I'm God and I'm telling you what to do, now get up. If I, I'm not getting up. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh, I, I can't. I won't. I can't. Um, I see the futility 
of it. And so there's only one answer. You said you're the vine and I'm the branch and your life is going to have to come. And you know what? Beginning of this year, the same thing happened. And I was in a bad place. And I was ready to let go. And the, and the Lord came to me as life, in me as life. Not words, not vision. And filled up a dried up goat skin. But it was a vessel. You know, that's what, they, that's what their drinking vessels were, goat skin. And he filled it up again, and he said, I'm ready to go. And I, but before he did that, I told him, if you don't do it, I'm not going to. I just don't think I have it left. I, I, you know, you, you, in a fight, you get knocked down, and you get up so many different times. And eventually you get beat so much you just lay in there and you just go, I don't, you know, this is dumb. I'm just going to get knocked down again. There's no need for me even getting up. The world would be better off without me. Just take me, Lord. And the Lord just comes in as life again. He said, I'm life. I'm your life. I have a desire to minister to the needy. I have a desire to spread the truth to those that are hungry. I have a desire. And then that desire begins to come out of you and you realize this is the Lord and not I, but Christ. And then you're able to do what you can't do because it's not you doing it. You are in Sabbath. You've rested from your works. But he's, come, he's bringing forth his life and his works. All right, we're going to quit because we started late and it's getting late. and We've had a rough schedule with the conference and everything, so I don't want to keep you too late. So let's just end with prayer. Father, we just thank you for the, the blessing of Jesus that, that this art can bring us into, this, this newness. We hear these things. We believe them, but we want to experience them as reality and as life in us. Lord, some may not face these things for many years yet. I pray you'll plant these seeds and help them to remember. Lord, if they're laying there in the, at night in despair, bring to remembrance your words, not mine, but your words that you've spoken to them. And that they might find hope when they feel so hopeless and that they might turn their eyes from themselves and their abilities unto you. For those that may be in those situations now, with all my heart, I pray for them, Lord, that they will awaken to what is theirs, that they will hold on and trust and go through the full measure of the ark and not despair and quit before the time until you have brought forth righteousness in the earth and it's your righteousness in them by your life. Father, we trust you and we look to you. We have no other resource. We believe in you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're dismissed.